out. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment of the Half-Baked Online Colloquia series, which is a series of colloquia on Zoom organized by Culinary Mind. And the series hosts talks by junior scholars, although our speaker today is no longer a junior scholar, <laughs> so very recently. Um, As of yesterday. <laughs> congratulations. Um, who work on food from different philosophical perspectives, broadly understood to include theoretical approaches to culture, society, gender, race, and history as they relate to food consumption and dieting. Colloquia are held on Fridays at 2.30 p.m. Maroon time, which is early over here on the East Coast uh, in the States. So today we are delighted to hear from Alex Plakius of Hamilton College in Central New York, who is sharing her paper called Food, Ignorance, and Epistemic Injustice. We will hear Alex's talk and then take a short break and then come back for discussion. Um, but as usual, you are welcome to put questions in the chat throughout the talk, and we'll collect those and, and come back to them during the discussion period. Um, so without further ado, I'll take it away, Alex. Great. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm just going to, somehow I messed up my screen share, so let me find that. Sorry about that. I'm all set to go. Okay. Um, so let's see. I'm just going to try to share my screen here. Um, while I'm figuring that out, let me just uh, say that this is very much a work in progress. So I'm really looking forward to your feedback. Um, we have a show here in the US called Chopped where they give contestants like some kind of random ingredients and then the challenge is you have to make a good dish out of it. And I feel like this talk is maybe a little bit like Chopped where I think I have some good ingredients but I don't know if I'm making the right thing with them. So. I'm hoping that um, if not during the Q&A, you can set me straight. So the name of this talk is Food Ignorance and Epistemic Injustice. So that should give you a sense of what I'm gonna talk about today. The claim I wanna defend is that we don't know what we're eating. And um, I'll argue that this matters because it represents a significant source of epistemic injustice in our food system. And towards the end of the talk, I'll, I'll gesture at some implications of this for thinking about both our conception of food justice. And I'll also argue that when we understand ignorance in the food system, it opens up additional dimensions of critique when we're thinking about new food technologies, food production, um, and things like that. So to give you a sense of what I mean by this claim, we don't know what we're eating, let me say a little bit about the background. Um, you know, I started thinking about this when I was teaching my introduction to philosophy class. And we look at these sort of traditional skeptical scenarios that you get in analytic philosophy, right? These kind of bizarre hypothetical cases where we're unable to achieve knowledge. Um, so in particular, you might be familiar with Alvin Goldman's fake barn country case, right? And he asks us to imagine someone named Henry who's driving through the countryside with his son and pointing things out. There's a tractor, there's a silo, there's a barn. And he says, you know, there's no problem saying Henry knows there's a barn, right? It's fine. Okay, but then he tweaks the case a little bit and he says, suppose we're told that unknown to Henry, he's entered this district full of facsimiles of barns, right? From the outside, they look exactly like barns, but they're really just facades. They're so cleverly constructed that people often mistake them for barns. And Henry, having just entered the district, hasn't actually encountered any fake barns. He sees a genuine barn, but if it were fake, he would still mistake it for a barn. Now Goldman thinks we no longer want to say that Henry knows the object he sees is a barn, right? He has managed to successfully point at one of the few real barns in the area, but given the prevalence of fakes, right, in his vicinity, he no longer has knowledge, right? And so in reading this case and in reading, you know, Goldman's, I should say, there's a lot of disagreement about how to interpret Goldman's claims and what the relevant conditions for knowledge that emerge from this are. 
But it seems to me that one thing we can learn from this case is that if you are in a sufficiently misleading environment or an environment that is deceptive enough, your beliefs will no longer rise to the level of knowledge. And so in reading this case and thinking about the kinds of skeptical scenarios that philosophers have constructed, it occurred to me that we actually encounter some of these skeptical scenarios every day in our ordinary environments. Um, and if you like bad puns, you can call this fake brand country, but I promise that that is the only really bad pun I will make in the course of this talk. Um, so I wanted to explore the ways in which our food environment is like fake barn country in that it contains enough deception, enough trickery, and enough fakery to prevent our beliefs about what we're eating from rising to the level of knowledge. Okay, so what do I have in mind here? Well, let's say there are two main ways we form beliefs about what we're eating. One involves perception, right? So we rely on taste, smell, visual appearance, maybe touch and sound to a lesser extent. And then we're heavily reliant also on testimony, right? So labels, lists of ingredients, and maybe word of mouth, things like that. I'm going to talk about um, several sources of deception that come in to play here. I think um, we find mislabeled, fraudulent products, adulterated products. And then in many cases, deception comes from labels that are misleading or what I'm gonna call like bullshit labeling, right? And here I mean bullshit in Frankfurt sense where it's not technically a lie, right? But it's just not in the business of conveying truthful information or even information at all. And I'll give some, I'll show some examples. Um, my claim is that when we take all of these sources of deception into account, there's the, the deception in our environment is so widespread, so prevalent that we should never feel comfortable ruling it out. And as a result, we don't know what we're eating, right? Even in cases where we form accurate beliefs, right? They still can't rise to the level of knowledge. Okay, so I mentioned fakes and frauds, right? Um, you know, this is a case that was just in the news. I don't know if you have, you have Subway in Europe, right? Um, it's like the sandwich chain. They've just been sued in the US by someone claiming their tuna is not tuna, but it's a mixture of various concoctions, right? What does that mean? Well, they're not going to tell you. It's a substance that does not constitute tuna, but it looks like tuna, right? Um, so that would be one example. Other more widespread cases are olive oil. Um, so I don't know if you know, there's a philosopher named Sarah Worth here in the US and she has a book on food and philosophy coming out this summer. And there's an entire book in her chapter devoted to olive oil and um, olive oil fraud basically. So at one point she quotes a, an expert saying that olive oil is the most adulterated agricultural product in the EU, right? Some of what's sold as olive oil is not olive oil at all. Um, some of it is cut with other oils and very little of it is actually extra virgin olive oil. And I feel, I admit that I feel a little silly telling Italians about olive oil. Um, so forgive me. There's also a uh, widespread fraud and mislabeling when it comes to seafood. So when you look at the seafood in stores and restaurants in major US cities, anywhere from 20 to 50% of it is not what it's labeled to be. Um, when you look at lobster dishes, they've done studies in major US chain restaurants, one third contain no lobster whatsoever and um, some contain no seafood at all, right? Um, so there's, you know, some cases where lobster ravioli just had no actual seafood in them, just cheese. Um, okay. You know, I could go on and on. There's, you know, some, you might remember the horse meat scandal in the UK where, uh, frozen food products were found to contain horse meat instead of ground beef. Um, there was another lawsuit here in the U S where, uh, Kraft was sued because their hot dogs claimed to be a hundred percent beef but in fact contained many other things and their defense was, and here's, this is classic bullshit, right? When we said 100% beef, we meant the beef in the hot dogs is 100% beef, but we never meant that the hot dog is 100% beef, right? 
Okay. Oops. Oops, sorry. So, so that's those are instances where the labels are, you know, outright where the, the food we're eating is not what we think it is. There's another kind of bullshit that we find on labeling, which has to do with kind of misleading the consumer, right? And this might have to do with either misleading ingredients. Um, so here on the right, I don't know how well you can see the slides, but there's a container of baby food, which is labeled as strawberry, raspberry, and banana puree. But when you actually look at the ingredients, it's 80% apples, right? I mean, that might seem fairly harmless, right? Apples are a fruit, it's a fruit. But nonetheless, if you buy this product, you think you're getting, uh, you don't think you're, you wouldn't expect to be getting apples, right? We also have claims like all natural, which are virtually meaningless, right? So here you have 100% all natural dinosaur shaped chicken nuggets, because what could be more natural than chicken shaped like a dinosaur? Um, or things like pure, right? Where here we have this diet drink that's pure strawberry kiwi flavor, right? You know, putting pure on a diet product, I think is especially pernicious. Um, we can talk more about that in the discussion. And then we also get these kinds of health claims, right? So here you have a chocolate flavored cereal that will help support your child's immunity, presumably because it has these uh, antioxidants that's a whole other <laughs> discussion and nutrients, right? Um, interestingly, if this claim were on a dietary supplement, like some kind of vitamin or something like that, it would be subject to stricter regulation, but because it's on a food package, there's very little regulation um, of the ability to make this kind of claim, right? So, you know, the problem is not just that these claims like pure and natural are virtually meaningless, right? The problem is that they feel meaningful. And this is, I think, one of the characteristics of bullshit, right? Is that it gives us the sense that we're getting some kind of information, but in fact, we learn nothing from these claims. Um, you know, there are other interesting cases involving like animal welfare certifications that we have here in the US where there's any number of certifications you can put on a product to make an animal welfare claim. Some of these are actually subject to fairly strict scrutiny, but many are not. And from the consumer perspective, knowing which is which um, is really difficult, right? And also we can talk about this in the discussion, you know, the kind of the way certification works with third party firms doing certifications is also really interesting. It turns out there's like a big business in making these kinds of certifications or offering these kinds of labels. Okay. So when we go back to the question of how do we know what we eat, right? With the case of perception, we rely on our senses, but, and this is a point that I think in that Sarah Worth makes very nicely in that olive oil chapter I mentioned, right? The problem isn't just that we're getting ripped off, that we're paying for products that we're not getting, but that is a problem, right? The problem isn't just that people can be made sick by eating foods that they don't expect to be eating, but that is also a problem. I believe like there was a case in Spain a while back where people died from consuming basically industrial grade oil that was labeled and being sold as olive oil, right? So these, you know, there are serious, serious consequences but another problem is that we don't know, right? What olive oil tastes like, or we don't know what, you know, certain uh, forms of seafood taste like, right? Often even something like certain kinds of fruits or vegetables, right? That we might think we know what they taste like. And in fact, we find out we don't, right? Um, I don't know if anyone else has had this kind of experience. I grew up, chewing like grape flavored bubble gum. I really liked grape flavored bubble gum and um, grape soda, grape jelly. But I would always think like, oh, this doesn't, that's not really what grapes taste like. Because in fact, like, you know, when you go to the grocery store and buy grapes, there's this total disconnect. But then a few years back, I went to our local farmer's market here in upstate New York and bought some Concord grapes, which I'd never had before. And I ate one and I immediately realized, oh, that's what the, the grape flavor is right so there was a strange experience where i thought the artificial grape flavor was getting it wrong but in fact it was the grapes i had been eating that didn't taste like grapes right and 
there's a similar story you can tell about banana flavoring, where initially there were two strains of banana on the market. The banana, artificial banana flavoring was developed to mimic one, which subsequently like became unavailable. Um, and now there's this disconnect between banana flavoring and what we think bananas taste like, right? So there are these interesting questions about how we know what food tastes like. Um, and my claim is that in many cases, perception is actually not a good guide. Um, I mentioned being, you know, our reliance on testimony. And here I think uh, these kinds of bullshit labeling claims undermine our ability to rely on testimony, right? We can no longer trust testimony as a source of knowledge, right? So my claim again is that we don't know what we're eating, but I wanna stress that this is not the consumer's fault, right? I don't think that this is the result of any kind of laziness or anything like that. Um, but this is not a kind of ignorance that just sort of happens, right? This is very much a manufactured sort of ignorance. Um, a manufactured sort of confusion and uncertainty in our food system, right? We are meant to be confused. We are meant to not know. Um, okay. So having said that, there's a number of objections you might have to the kind of claim I'm making. So let me just go through a few um, in turn. So the first is a kind of companions and guilt objection, right? Um, you might think there's lots of cases where we consume things, we don't know what they contain or what they are even, and we're fine with that, right? So why should we worry here? I asked my husband, like, what's the thing in your medicine cabinet that you don't know really what it is or how it works? He was like, Advil. I was like, oh, but that's ibuprofen. And he was like, but what's ibuprofen, <laughs> right? So you might think, okay, fine, this happens all the time. I think that's true, right? I think there's a few responses. One is that food is different somehow, right? Um, we have a different kind of relationship with food. We hold people responsible for their food choices in a way that we don't for other choices, right? And I think we identify people with their food choices in a way that we might not in other cases. Um, I think we also, the problem with food is not just that we don't know, but that we feel like we know in a way that, you know, we don't expect to understand how our medications work. That's why we get them from a doctor. Um, I mean, the second response, I think, to any companions and guilt argument is like, there's plenty of guilt to go around for everyone. So, you know, great. Okay. You know, I also want to acknowledge that fears of adulteration in our food go way, way back and there's a great book uh, called Fear of Food that will detail, you know, the history of, um, of this kind of thing. So, you know, this is not a new worry. And in fact, processed foods historically were often seen as safer and more reliable than food we made at home, right? Um, I think that's right. And I think part of what's new here or part of what, you know, I mean, First, the fact that a problem is old doesn't make it less problematic, right? But secondly, what's I think new is not the problem, it's the scale of the problem, right? So where you see, you know, um, even just in the last decade, a massive increase in sale of packaged food. We see 75% um, of the calories consumed in the US coming from packaged foods, right? The average supermarket now carries around 60,000 products. Um, and, you know, there's a reason for that, which is that processed food is profitable, right? Selling unprocessed food is not going to be as profitable as selling processed food. Um, something that might be worth bearing in mind as we get into the epistemic injustice part of this is also the fact that as processed food manufacturers are having a harder time selling their foods in the U.S., they are moving into markets in developing nations, right? So, this is a problem in the US, but it's increasingly becoming a problem that we are exporting to other parts of the world, um, just as we, you know, just as tobacco companies moved their products into developing nations when they could no longer market them in the US. Okay, lastly, I think there is a particular epistemic worry about processed food. There have been studies showing that the more processed a food is, the more health claims you're likely to find on that food label. Okay. Another objection that I do think is a worry here has to do with like whether this is really just a kind of bias against a certain kind of food, right? So you might think that um, if you're familiar with molecular gastronomy, 
we actually really enjoy a certain kind of deceit or trickery in a lot of food. And when we're paying hundreds of dollars a plate for it, we celebrate this, right? But when we're paying a dollar for it um, in the gas station, we see it as this kind of thing to be looked down on. We see it as a moral problem, right? So you might worry about whether there's just a kind of bias or prejudice here against not all processed food, but a certain kind of processed food. Um, and that is something I worry about. I, you know, if I'm being fully honest, part of the motivation for this talk was my own intuition that there is something wrong with processed food and trying to figure out like, well, what is it about this food that bothers me so much that I find objectionable, right? And, you know, what I'm trying to do here is offer an epistemic diagnosis of the problem. Okay, so, but then why does the Twizzler on the right bother me more than the sort of fruit gel spaghetti that, you know, we see in the middle here? I think, you know, there's a few things to say. One is that um, when we go into a restaurant and pay hundreds of dollars for molecular gastronomy, we know what we're doing, right? And we consent to and, you know, embrace the deception or the opacity, right? In a way that we don't necessarily in other food environments, right? You know, there are many reasons people choose processed foods. Some people may not want to know more and that's fine, right? I want to acknowledge that if people choose processed food, that is fine. That is a choice that people can make and people can also choose not to know more about what they're eating. Um, but I think there are two worries. One is that in many cases, people do not have a choice, right? This is not a choice people are making. And here there's like this, I can't remember the paper. There's an interesting distinction between choosing and just kind of picking something, right? So the question is, are people choosing processed food or are they just kind of picking it because it's there? And then this other worry that um, the kind of deceptive labeling I've been describing undermines our trust in the food system more broadly, right? And creates this kind of um, confusion that I've alluded to before. Having said that, I think we do need to be aware of the potential for bias in how we represent these issues. And I think that's true, not just for the kinds of worries I'm raising today, but our discourse about health and nutrition more broadly, right? When we think about who needs to be educated about healthy eating, right? We often have a certain kind of um, individual in mind. And I think that it's easy or it's, it's too common for certain kinds of bias to creep into our picture of who we're trying to educate there. Um, I also think that it's important to be realistic about the barriers uh, to accessing healthy food and to accessing knowledge of what we're eating. But I'll say more about that in a moment. Okay. So the last and maybe the objection that's most obvious is like, I've, I've exaggerated here because of course, like we can all know looking at this, that this is an apple, right? And so really the problem I'm pointing to is not a problem for all foods, but just some subset of foods, namely processed ones, right? And that we can escape this kind of skeptical worry by focusing on fresh or minimally processed foods. Um, I think that is true. But I also think that this is a strategy that is costly in terms of both money and time, right? And I think time is a dimension of cost here that often gets overlooked, right? We know that fresh food can be more expensive than processed food, but we also, you know, should recognize that it takes longer to prepare. It spoils faster, so you have to go get it more often. And in areas of the US, like where I live, that might mean a 45 minute drive to the nearest grocery store, right? You can be at a Dollar General, which is like, you know, a store that sells like packaged foods within pretty much 15 minutes. But there are areas not far from me where it really would be a 45 minute drive to a store selling fresh food. Okay. Um, you know, I've put food deserts in, quote, in quotes here because there's a, um, there's a food activist in New York City, Karen Washington, who says, deserts are things that occur naturally. Like food deserts are not a natural phenomenon. We should call it food apartheid, right? Because this is something that is, um, that is man-made, that is an injustice that's imposed on communities, right? Rather than something that just happens. Although we think of it that way, like, oh, there just happened to not be any stores around here. Okay. The result and the takeaway here is that, yes, we can escape skepticism in this way, but at a cost, 
because the cost is that knowledge of what we're eating becomes a commodity um, that is accessible only to some people or some communities, okay? Yes, you can get knowledge of what you're eating by going to the farmer's market and buying food directly from a farmer. That is not available to everyone. As a result, knowledge is not available to everyone. So my claim is that this represents an instance of epistemic injustice. Um, you know, if you're not familiar, this is just the idea that there are injustices done to people in their capacities as knowers or epistemic agents. There are three types. Um, I'm going to claim that the injustice I'm describing here is a case of distributive injustice. And I've got the definitions here. Distributive injustice is last, the last definition on this list. It's also sometimes treated as least. So like in Miranda Fricker's book on epistemic injustice, she devotes very little time to this. And like right on the first page, she's just like, this is not very interesting. This is not a very interesting form of epistemic injustice because it's just, you know, it's distributive injustice. The thing in question just happens to be knowledge, right? So there are, you know, I was talking to Megan before the talk began about cases of testimonial injustice in the food system. And, you know, Megan has done some work on eating disorders and vegetarianism, where it seems like young women especially find that their professed reasons for vegetarianism are not taken seriously um, or are not given uh, their testimony isn't accorded the weight it deserves. There are also, you know, many cases, many documented cases where the stigma surrounding weight prevents patients' complaints from being taken seriously by doctors, right? If you are a fat patient, and I use that word intentionally, um, uh, and you go to the doctor with a complaint, most often you'll be told it is about your weight, right? The cause of your complaint is your weight. So here we have a case where a patient uh, had scoliosis and her doctor told her, you just need to lose weight. There have been other cases where patients' cancer went undiagnosed, right? Because doctors were so focused on their weight. Um, and I think more generally, the way we think about the relationship between diet and weight loss shows that we don't take patients' testimony seriously. So if you read accounts of people trying to lose weight, what often happens is they're told by their doctor, oh, eat this, this many calories and you'll lose weight, right? And they go to the doctor and they say, I'm eating this many calories and I'm not losing weight. And the response is, well, you must be wrong. You must be wrong about what you're eating. You're not keeping track properly. You're not counting your calories, right? And, you know, it's interesting. We are so wedded to this model of how weight loss should work that we discount the like staggering number of testimonials from patients who have reported that this is not in fact working for them, right? So this isn't just like one or two patients going, this is like, you know, decades and decades of people saying like, I tried this, it didn't work. And yet, you know, because doctors see these patients um, in a certain light, they refuse to accept their testimony. Okay, so what does this have to do with what I've been talking about? Um, you know, I think there's some also interesting like questions about where we find hermeneutical injustice, but I'm gonna skip it for time and because I haven't thought it all through yet and maybe we can talk about it in the discussion. I think that, as I said, distributive epistemic injustice is often seen as less interesting than testimonial injustice. And in a totally unfounded estimate, I would say like 90% of the literature on epistemic injustice focuses on hermeneutical injustice and testimonial injustice. Um, but it occurred to me that, look, if people don't know what they're eating, then it seems like we do have grounds for dismissing their testimony, right? So in fact, these forms of epistemic injustice really go hand in hand. And the distributive epistemic injustice here by denying knowledge of what people are eating, right? Um, we therefore entitle ourselves to treat their testimony as less credible, right? We legitimize that kind of testimonial injustice by creating uh, distributive injustice in the food system, right? So if a patient genuinely doesn't know what they're eating, then the doctor has grounds for discounting their testimony, right? And I think that's a real worry and a real problem. And I think that um, at least when it comes to food, we might see this kind of testimonial injustice as underwritten by this distributive injustice in the food system. So I think when we think about ways to remedy the testimonial injustice, part of that has to involve giving you know, genuinely allowing people to have better access to information about what they eat. Okay, 
I'm gonna, that's pretty much the talk. I'll just end by talking about two implications um, that I think this way of seeing the problem has. The first has to do with our definition of food justice. Um, you know, if you, if in thinking about the way that our concept of food justice evolves, one of the concepts that's really uh, received emphasis in recent years is food sovereignty, right? Communities and individuals um, and cultures taking charge of and um, being self-directed in terms of the foods that they grow, sell and eat, right? And I think as we think about food sovereignty, we might see a kind of epistemic sovereignty as an important component to that. So I guess what I'm urging here is just that we think about food justice as including epistemic justice, that that's an important component there too. Um, and an important benefit of the food justice movement. So um, we see the two as going hand in hand. The second implication or application of this that I think is interesting is in thinking about um, the so-called like lab-grown meat. And I say so-called because I just did a panel here at Hamilton with some on lab-grown meat. And we had the CEO of a company developing a seafood product. And it turns out first, they hate the, the term lab-grown. Like nobody wants to call it that. Um, but one of the things that he mentioned, you know, we were talking about his talk in advance. He's like, well, I'm not really going to talk about the science because, you know, people won't really understand it. And also it's proprietary, right? Like, I can't tell you exactly how we do this because this is our, you know, special proprietary technology. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, right? There are many ethical reasons to be excited about these products, I think. You know, no one would argue that sustainability, relieving animal suffering, ending factory farming, these are all great goals. But I think it's important to also acknowledge that, you know, along with this comes a certain degree of epistemic distance, right, from our food. And furthermore, you know, if these technologies really do remain proprietary, that's not just a kind of epistemic gap that's incidental, it may be one that's unbridgeable, right? We, you know, if companies have the right to kind of keep this technology um, off limits from the consumer, we may never fully understand the process by which these things are produced. Now, having said that, I should acknowledge the FDA like just published their, so one of the big debates about these foods is like what to call them, right? As I mentioned. And so the FDA is in the process of deciding like what can we call these things, right? Similar to the debate over whether like you can call something an egg if it's plant-based, right? What should we call these kinds of meat and seafood? So the FDA just released their like public comments. And one theme that emerges is what will these names lead consumers to believe? Right. So there's been a number of studies now and more are emerging on like when you tell someone this is cell cultured, what do they then think? Right. So one theme that emerged from the studies on seafood is that if you tell people um, cultivated seafood, they think farmed seafood. So that's a reason why people are moving away from the idea of calling um, calling this cell cultivated seafood is that it has too much of an association with farming. So, you know. Both, this is something I'm independently interested in. So I'm gonna stop because I'm going off on a tangent here, but I'll just end by saying that in addition to offering us a new way to think about food justice, I think that epistemic injustice also offers us a new avenue of critique for emerging food technologies and for existing processed foods. So I will stop there. Okay, thanks. Thank you.